It's 1937, and a machete hacks through a clump of vines, clearing a path for famed adventurer, world-renowned treasure hunter, and charming scoundrel, Drake Jonesy O'Connolly. Of course, all his reputation is as greatly exaggerated as the swagger with which he strides through the rainforest. All the actual adventuring and uncovering of ancient artifacts is really the work of Jonesy's counterpart, Evie Croftsworth, a brilliant, Oxford-educated archaeologist who tails behind him as he leads the way, despite not being the one holding the map. Evie sighs as she sees Jonesy looking around for which route to take next. She only really tolerates him because he comes in handy when other rival treasure hunters start shooting at them. Jonesy has a miraculous habit of attracting bullets, luckily for her. The pair have journeyed across more of the globe together than most people will ever see in their lifetimes, tracking down buried treasures and the remnants of ancient civilizations lost to time. For Evie, it is a purely educational pursuit. She does it to preserve knowledge and put the items they find into the hands of fellow scholars, so that her findings might one day wind up in museums. Jonesy is here solely for the money, and the thrill of the adventure that makes it worth occasionally being shot at. After successfully recovering an ancient casket that was said to contain the wrath of God himself from an underground tomb, the intrepid pair have arrived at their next destination. Jetting halfway around the world to hike through the humid rainforest is hardly cheap or easy, especially in the 1930s. But thanks to the wealth bequeathed to Evie by her late family and Jonesy's connections with various pilots and smugglers, they've arrived to track down the ruins of a temple that's supposedly hidden in this particular area of rainforest. Fragments of a map were delivered to one of the museum owners Evie works with, and once she had confirmed their legitimacy, it seemed like exactly the kind of mystery her and her admittedly useful but ultimately loudish partner could solve. Once fully translated, the map spoke of part of the rainforest that seemed to have been cursed. According to scrawls left on the torn parchment, it had something to do with a high priest at the temple that lay in the heart of the trees. Apparently, to keep the temple safe from interlopers, the high priest had cast a spell to bring the surrounding trees to life, compelling them to attack anyone who ventured close to the temple. That was the legend, at least. Based on where Evie judges their current position to be, they aren't far now, and there's been no sign of killer trees. Not yet, anyway. She directs Jonesy, who starts up cleaving the foliage around them with his machete, clearly not compensating for anything. The two of them venture further into the rainforest, trying to at least locate the ruined temple before nightfall. Even if they can't get inside by the time it gets dark, they can set up camp nearby and try to gain access in the morning. But despite her expert navigational skills, Evie can't locate the temple. She stops, tries to get her bearings, but each time either Jonesy's inane comments throw her off kilter, or she gets the exact latitude and longitude muddled. The heat and humidity of the rainforest aren't helping, neither is the fact that the pair of them are both exhausted from a long day's hike. Add to that the fact that all Evie has to work off of is the only surviving pieces of an inaccurate map from centuries ago, and the whole expedition is starting to feel like it's falling apart. Night begins to fall, and no closer to finding the temple, the pair decide to set up their individual tents and bed down for the night. In the morning, they'll be able to think clearer, having had some sleep. But throughout the whole night, Evie is restless. She's convinced that she followed the map accurately, even accounting for any margins of error. They should be at the temple already, by now she's an expert at this. Hell, even Jonesy has at least learned a few things from their many adventures. Speaking of Jonesy, she's set up her tent too close to his again. Unable to sleep because of her overactive thoughts, being able to hear him snore isn't helping Evie get any rest either. The tent flap opens, and Jonesy walks a few feet away. How typical that the natural beauty of this rainforest should be made into this man's latrine. The first few minutes of quiet pass. The rainforest is still. And laying in her tent, Evie suddenly realizes what's wrong with that. The place should be teeming with wildlife. They should be able to hear birds calling from the treetops or the flap of their wings from overhead. But there's nothing. Distressed at having only just noticed this, Evie gets up and scrambles out of her tent, grabbing a flashlight and calling out to Jonesy. She spots him standing a few feet away, his back to her, and rushes over. The whole time she's hurriedly explaining what she's just realized, worried that there might well be something else in the rainforest, a predator that scared all the wildlife away that could have led whoever made the map to believe the place was cursed. Only once she stops talking, 
Evie notices Jonesy hasn't moved. He's as unnervingly still as the rest of the rainforest. The beam of Evie's flashlight catches something, a long strand reaching down from the treetops, winding its way around Jonesy's arms. She follows it with the light up and up towards the branches, and Evie screams in horror at what she sees above them. Several decades pass, even the turn of a millennium, and the names of Evie Croftsworth and Drake O'Connolly are as lost to time as the treasures they once spent their lives searching for. Then, one day, the area of rainforest they vanished in starts experiencing heavy deforestation. Trees are being sawed down and toppled to clear the way for construction crews, reducing the size of the rainforest to allow for yet more people to inhabit the area. Why? That's because typically, where there are people, there are ways for corporations to make profits. Of course, as is the case with any deforestation effort, the upfront cost is normally paid by the unfortunate wildlife in the area. Though often the trees being cut down and animals being evicted from their homes aren't able to fight back against humans destroying their habitat. Most of the time, at least. Concerned reports are spreading through the workers as they're following orders to chop down trees. Eventually, word reaches the foreman at the head of the operation. The men have been whispering that two of the advanced parties scouting ahead into the rainforest haven't checked in for quite some time. The foreman sighs. He's been expecting trouble since the job started. He works for the company responsible for bankrolling the deforestation effort, whose investment dollars will be funding the construction that all this natural beauty is standing in the way of. Given that wiping out large swathes of the rainforest to build hotels or oil pipelines is typically frowned upon by some people, and not to mention the environment not always being conducive to safety, the company often turns to dubious methods to keep its tree-cutting crews protected. That job gets outsourced to mercenaries, private military contractors whose sense of morality and ethics are a lot more pliable, especially when offered large sums of money. Their role is usually to scare off locals, both the wildlife and human varieties, as well as deterring peaceful protesters who decide to make their objection to the destruction of the rainforest known. Working with armed soldiers of fortune isn't for everyone, hence the tension the foreman has been feeling since the operation had begun. Now, according to his tree cutters, some of these company-provided mercenaries are missing in the rainforest, and everyone's looking to the foreman to figure out what to do. He can't halt his men from chopping down trees to go and search for the missing mercenaries. He knows the company has strict deadlines they want to keep to. And sending the remaining soldiers away to conduct a sweep of the area leaves his tree-cutting crew unprotected against wild animals or people with understandable moral objections to destroying the rainforest. Short on time and options, the foreman decides on a combination of the only two available to him. He gathers a small group, half comprised of the remaining mercenaries, the other half taken from his cutters, and leads them off into the rainforest in search of the rest of the missing security detail. Hours spent trudging through the unbearably humid rainforest yielded no sign of the advance teams. Eventually, as the sun starts falling behind the tree line, the foreman is forced to make the decision to call off the search. Two days pass, with each one seeing the foreman once again rounding up the same mix of mercenaries and tree cutters to continue the search, but to no avail, until the second day following the advance team's disappearances. Fanning out to cover more ground, some of the leftover mercenaries aiding in the search effort suddenly spot a pair of the advance squads resting against the large buttress roots of a Saba tree. The mercenaries call out to their comrades, knowing the pair of them must be exhausted and likely both dehydrated and starving after two days with only their canteens and emergency rations to depend on. But there's no response. The mercenary units call out a second time, yet still the men propped up against the large tree don't budge. Then one moves. Even at a distance, it's clear that he's waving his fellow mercenaries over for assistance. One or both of them could be injured so the soldiers of the search team rush over, only to wish they hadn't. As they approach, they can see the pair of mercenaries closer. What looks to be thin vines are reaching down and pulling at the arms of both of their missing comrades, manipulating them like the strings of a marionette puppet. Something is very, very wrong here. The call goes out to the foreman and the rest of the search party. Mercenaries trained as field medics are brought over and told to examine the two men, still suspended by the strange vines pulling at their arms. Drawing closer, the medics step on what they think are just more vines strewn about the rainforest floor. But those aren't vines. 
The newspaper reports blame a spate of disappearances when the deforestation operation shuts down. Those living nearby breathe a collective sigh of relief that the company, after losing 11 of their cutters and mercenaries, decided to withdraw from the rainforest. Their official statement calls it a temporary suspension of the project, but doesn't reveal to the public the truth, that the tree crews and mercenaries who had returned outright refused to go back. Every one of them seems too traumatized by what they've seen to even consider it. No matter how much compensation the company offers, many resign altogether. Many of the tree cutters walking out on the spot, while the mercenaries move on to new contracts. The same headlines reporting on the incident soon make it to the SCP Foundation, who dispatch their own team to investigate. Mobile task force operators are far better equipped than ragtag mercenaries, and they know not to wander too far into unfamiliar territory. What they find leads to a total quarantine of the rainforest. 14 specimens of giant flying jellyfish. As anomalous species go, few are as unnerving as SCP-1158, otherwise known as the arboreal puppeteers, or by their far more simplistic description, the flying killer jellyfish. As you might expect from a name like that, these anomalous invertebrates bear a striking resemblance to a pre-existing marine species, the Physalia fissilis, or Portuguese man-o-war colloquially. Despite often being referred to as jellyfish, the Portuguese man-o-war actually belongs to a group of animals called siphonophores. These are closely related to jellyfish, however, where jellyfish are singular organisms, siphonophores are a colony of genetically identical zooids. In other words, a group of clones that work together as one, with each performing a specific function to facilitate survival. SCP-1158 shares the same attributes of siphonophores, with each of its various parts being responsible for certain tasks. The one major difference is that, while siphonophores are a form of marine life typically found in deep-sea locations, SCP-1158 has a far different natural habitat, the rainforest. That's right, these jellyfish are found dwelling in treetops. However, much like the species of Australian bears that are rumored to drop from branches to attack human tourists from above, the habitat of SCP-1158 seems limited to a specific area specifically a 500-kilometer radius of rainforest that surrounds a location that has been redacted by the SCP Foundation. While redaction makes it unclear where this region is, the Foundation's database entry regarding the anomaly does mention the presence of Saba trees in the area. This leads to the assumption that the first encounter with an instance of SCP-1158 could have taken place in any rainforest-dense area where Saba trees are native. These possible locations include Mexico, Central America, the northern part of South America, the Caribbean, or West Africa. Another smaller variety of Saba is also found in certain areas of South and Southeast Asia. The specimens of SCP-1158 are brought back to the Foundation for examination. For one, Foundation researchers need to ascertain exactly what happened to the deforestation crew. For another, it's rare to see jellyfish this big. Most specimens of the non-anomalous Portuguese man war can, on average, grow to between 30 and 100 feet long from the float down to the tips of its numerous strands of tentacles and polyps. By comparison, the pneumatophore alone, the gas-filled float that the polyps are attached to, of the captured SCP-1158 specimens is around 13 feet tall. These aren't just large jellyfish, they're enormous. Foundation testing reveals that each SCP-1158 instance has a concentrated amount of hydrogen within its pneumatophore. Thought to have been produced as a byproduct of bacterial decay, the resultant hydrogen gas provides each creature with lift, allowing them to float upwards to a degree, like balloons, although perhaps not the kind you'd want at a birthday party, unless you really didn't like the guests. Once airborne, these olive drab invertebrates will nest themselves in the high up treetops of taller rainforest flora, typically remaining hidden just beneath the foliage and allowing its polyps to hang down through the branches, with most being long enough to reach the forest floor, even at higher elevations. Given the coloration of each instance of SCP-1158, the creature seems to have evolved in such a way that they have a natural camouflage, allowing their tentacles to blend in with the various vines that typically hang from certain varieties of trees found in the rainforest. SCP-1158's tentacles are far from vestigial, but nor are they, strictly speaking, limbs that can be used in the same way that a human being's arms or legs function. They are polyps, 
the collection of genetically identical parts possessed by siphonophores. Each of these performs a specific function, and SCP-1158's dactylozoids polyp bundles, for example, are their defensive polyps. These are somewhat prehensile, meaning that they can be moved to a limited degree. Those that reach down from the treetops and remain camouflaged among vines are the polyps responsible for detection and feeding. The primary prey of SCP-1158 is limited to mammals and reptiles. Any animal at around 50 kilograms in mass or more that the creature detects will be targeted for the jellyfish to feed on. This occurs when a victim comes into contact with the defensive dactylozoid polyps, which are commonly laying on the ground or against a tree where an SCP-1158 instance is nesting. When this happens, prey are captured by these specialized polyps and subjected to an injection of a paralyzing neurotoxin that is produced within the nematocysts of an SCP-1158's dactylozoid polyps. With their target rendered immobile thanks to the neurotoxin, the SCP-1158 instance will wrap its nearby polyp threads around the victim and restrain them. As if that wasn't bad enough, this is where the process gets even more unpleasant. It takes approximately six seconds for one of these flying killer jellyfish to poison and ensnare one of its victims, after which time the creature's primary feeding polyps are deployed. These will enter the jellyfish's prey, typically via the mouth or ears, then release powerful digestive enzymes to disintegrate the target's internal organs. The resultant mess is absorbed directly by the polyps, effectively hollowing out an animal, or a person, from the inside. This process can go on for approximately four excruciating days. The only consolation is that usually SCP-1158's target is dead after just two. If at any point the creature's prey is approached by others, the polyps will trigger a muscular spasm that causes the victim to stand on its hind legs and wave its front legs. When SCP-1158 eats a human, this motion can be perceived as a beckoning gesture or one motioning other humans to come closer which is exactly what the mercenaries saw the two stuck squad mates doing. Hence the alternate name for SCP-1158, the Arboreal Jellyfish Puppeteers. Two weeks of testing pass after the specimens of SCP-1158 are brought to the Foundation. After this time, the creatures are placed in their containment habitat at Site-19's hazardous life forms wing. Within the enclosure is a near-perfect recreation of the rainforest the jellyfish were found in. The temperature and humidity are kept at just the right levels, maintained by Foundation personnel. Throughout the habitat are sensor pods, observing the jellyfish. In the interest of watching their behavioral and feeding patterns, researchers introduce a live adult domestic pig into the enclosure to act as prey for the 14 SCP-1158 instances inside. The experiment does not go well. At first, the pig just wanders around, exploring its newfound environment until eventually it finds itself caught in the polyps of an SCP-1158 specimen. As to be expected, the dactylozoid polyps begin to administer the neurotoxin in order to commence the unpleasant feeding process, but for reasons unknown, it doesn't work. Instead, the pig, despite being initially startled and squealing in fear, starts to free itself from the giant jellyfish by biting its way out. The pig is able to chew its way through the strands of polyps without suffering the paralyzing effects of SCP-1158's neurotoxin. And then, upon being dropped back to freedom, it grips the remainder of the creature's vine-like appendages in its mouth. The pig pulls the flying killer jellyfish down from the safety of the canopy up in the treetops, then tramples them to death, eating what's left behind. Overall, six specimens are lost as a result. Baffling Foundation researchers, all species of pig they test seem to be completely unaffected by the jellyfish's neurotoxin. The reason for this remains unknown. Instead, the Foundation introduces one live adult sheep to the remaining eight SCP-1158 instances every 21 days in order to allow the creatures to feed. Should maintenance be required within the enclosure, then SCP-1158's habitat is accessed via a positive pressure airlock. On a weekly basis, Foundation staff are sent in wearing Tyvek exposure suits to protect against chemical threats, in particular the neurotoxin produced by the jellyfish's defensive polyps. Maintenance teams are accompanied by mobile task force operatives armed with standard issue M1014 shotguns and are permitted to use lethal force should any of the specimens of SCP-1158 become aggressive. All Foundation personnel assigned to enter the enclosure seem to concur that, despite the humidity, it's fine as long as you don't look up 
at what's in the trees. Check out the Dr. Bob Patreon and become a junior researcher today. Now go and watch another entry from the files of Dr. Bob, like SCP-2846, The Squid and the Sailor.